Okay. Okay. So um, we'll pray and then we'll get started. Okay. So I just want you to want us to pray this. You know, whatever we've been, we whatever we've been learning about, you know, what God thinks about money, what God thinks about people having money, right? What God thinks about us as believers um, carrying money or having money, using money, etc. You know, just say that, Lord. Uh, let let it change my thinking. Okay, I want to think, or I want to consider the things that you're considering, uh, or I want to think consider the same the same way that you are considering. You know, whatever he is giving importance to, we'll pray, Lord. You, I will. I also want to give the same importance. Right, whatever is precious to you, let it be precious to me. Whatever is worthless to you, let it be worthless to me also. Right. So that's a good prayer to pray. Right? Saying that, Lord, whatever you are giving importance, I want to have, I want to give it the same importance. You know, whatever he considers as something precious or something valuable, it's only right that we also consider that the same way. Right? So let's pray. Okay? Father, we, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this day. We thank you for bringing us here. Master, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word, the work of your spirit in us, Lord. And even today, Lord, we Lord, um, help us to, Lord, consider and help us to look at things the way you see it, Lord. Lord, especially with regard to money, Lord, we pray that, Lord, whatever is precious to you, uh, let it be precious to us, Lord. And whatever you consider as worthless, Lord, we pray that we will also, Lord, look at it the same way, that something is worthless, God. And Father God, we pray that um, that we will have your heart when it comes to, Lord, material things, finances, and prosperity, and all these things, Lord. Lord, I, we pray that um, if we have been, Lord, thinking about it in a different way, Lord, may we, Lord, may our minds, may our thoughts and everything, Lord, be aligned, brought in line with your word and your way of thinking and doing things, Lord. And Master, we commit ourselves to this. Uh, Holy Spirit, empower us, enable us. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> share the notes. So um, last class we we uh, we studied some of the people who prospered, right, and uh, whom God prospered, and some of the people who also fell because of money, right. Uh, we looked at uh, we we looked at uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you know, three generations. We looked at Joseph, we looked at Job, and all these people whom God actually prospered. Right, so uh, we we studied that word prosperity. It means more than money. Right, it means success. It means growth. It means increase. Right, but it includes money also. Right, so we see how God prospered all these people. We also looked at the negative side of money. You know, money getting a hold of people. We we, we looked at Balaam, Gehazi, and in the New Testament there are two others who are mentioned. Um, so maybe we can quickly look at those verses. Second Corinthians four and verse ten, uh, where Paul says, Second Corinthians four ten. And if you're looking at your notes, we're in page ten. Okay. So Second Corinthians four and verse ten. So Paul says, "For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world." Okay. So Paul is in ministry. And uh, he's got this team of young people that he's raising up. And as a team, they are traveling, they are ministering, sharing the gospel. So Paul is saying that, you know, he's writing to Timothy and he's saying, you know, you come to me quickly because Demas has forsaken me, having loved the present world. So, so what he's saying is that, uh, you know, the, the present things of the world has been more attractive to him. So he has decided not to, you know, work together anymore. Okay. Then we read about Judas Iscariot. In Luke chapter 22, verses 4 to 6, um, he, he goes and he plans with the chief priests 
uh, how to betray Jesus and uh, they agreed to give money and so he promised and sought opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. Now, Judas had a problem with money. Right? Um, it's not only these 30 pieces of silver, even earlier. right? Can anyone tell me what kind of a problem he had with money? Did he have a problem with money? He is to steal from the church money. Yeah, so they had this, he was like a treasurer, right? He was handling the funds and finances of, we can say, the ministry, right? They were all together and traveling and so on. But the Bible, the Gospels talk about how he used to, you know, put his hand in that and take whatever was required for him, right? For his needs, he would take, he would use that money, right? What was meant for the ministry so he would actually so so money had a pull pull on him like he was drawn he was attracted to money and here they agreed to give him a certain sum of money and he decided that he will betray the lord jesus so now we don't know what was going on in his mind you know he was with him and why suddenly you know this kind of a decision which means that you know um he was always um in his heart his heart was divided and he was drawn to the world, he was drawn to money, um, so much so that he did not really esteem Jesus and his words as highly as money. Right? If you had to put two things on a scale, right, for him it was always money which was which was heavier or greater than uh, the words of the Lord and whatever he was, you know, sharing and teaching and so on. So the sad thing is this, you know, when the Lord Jesus sent them out two by two, right, before him to do those things that he called them to do, okay, so all of them went, they, they declared about the, the gospel of the kingdom, they laid hands on the sick, you know, that is the thing which he sent them out, right, mandate, go lay, on the, lay hands on the sick, um, you know, drive out demons, etc., so he, they went, and he was also part of that, right? We should never forget, he was also part of that. He went, he preached the kingdom, he laid hands on the sick, the sick were healed, he delivered, you know, he went and, um, you, know, uh, you know, kind of cast out demons and was delivered. And it also talks about, if you look at Luke chapter 10, okay? Um, can go there. Luke chapter 9, sorry. Okay, he called his 12 disciples together, right? So, which means Judas was also part of that, right? And he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Verse, three, uh, verse 2, he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick, right? Then, if you look at chapter 10, Luke chapter 10. Okay. It says, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he was about to go. And again, he sent them with the instruction. Then the 70 returned with joy and um, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to your name. So he sent them out. He empowered them to go heal, to go deliver, to go preach. So they went out. So Judas was part of that, right? But somehow, money had a hold on him. Okay. Money had a hold on him. So we see that, uh, you know, these were men of God. Demas, part of Paul's team, ministry team of those days, seeing great and mighty things the Lord is doing, facing a lot of difficulties and persecution. But at the same time, seeing what was God, what God was doing in the lives of people, all the you know wonderful things, people's lives being transformed, everything. He's seeing right then and there before his eyes. But he loved the world. Okay, so so we, we learn something about you know how we need to treat money. It is important, it is useful, there are a lot of things that we can do, but we need to be careful. We need to be discerning, right? We need to give 
the rightful place for money in our lives. It is a useful thing. We can't say, you know, I don't need money. Um, you know, it's it's waste. I don't need to, you know, I don't need to earn. All right. We can't say that also, right? Because everything that we need to do in life, whatever God has called us to do, God is not against money. But we need to be careful so that money does not get a hold of us, that we don't, don't become people of greed or covetousness. Okay? Okay. So let's look at a, a few more verses okay, that talks about God's heart, um, you know, with regard to material blessings and finances. Okay, so, you know, why are we looking at all this? Why are we studying all this? You know, so that we get a, get to understand that this is how God that uh, God looks at money. Okay, so this is how God blesses. Okay, so the, sometimes we might have a different understanding. Okay, maybe God does not want to bless. Maybe God is holding back. Maybe God does not want me to have. Okay, he might want others to have, but he does not want me to have. Right? But uh, if you look at the word of God, we see something very different about the very nature of God. Okay? So let's look at um, you know, uh, 2 Samuel 6. Okay? We are looking at the topic, God gives material blessings and financial miracles. Right? So if you look at 2 Samuel 6, verses 10 and 12, so this is about uh, the ark of God, ark of the Lord, which uh, David was bringing from the Philistines. So he, what happens? The the backstory is that it falls, and uh, Uza reaches out his hand to steady it, and he he dies, right? He he dies there immediately. So now they did not move the ark. What did they do? They they didn't bring it into you know into Jerusalem. So they kept it into Bethlehem. They kept it in the house of Obed Edom, right there. Okay. So that is what we see. Second Samuel six verse ten. They they kept it right there. In they did not. Let me just read that verse. Verse ten. So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David. But David took it aside into the house of Obed Edom the Gittite. Verse 11 The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed Edom the Gittite for three months. Right? And the Lord blessed Obed Edom and all his household. Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. Okay. So what, what was this ark of God? I'm sure you've studied in praise and worship, right? So what was this ark of God? What is this ark of God? Excuse me. Anyone? You, you studied, right? Presence of God. Sorry? Presence of God. No, but what is it? God was it... Uh, dwelling yeah. Uh, in. Yeah, physically, what was it, sister? Uh, it was the rod of iron, uh, Aaron. Okay. And the uh, tablet of the Ten Commandments was there. Okay. Right. Um, so what was it? It was a. It was a. It was a physical box, right? Yeah, it was a. Yeah. And it had rods. Which, and, uh, yeah. So yeah. it had all these there things was, inside, yeah. which had the the pot, um, of mana, the the rod yeah, yeah. of Aaron, the tablets, yeah. right? Uh, ten um, ten commandments, the tablets, um, everything was there inside. And um, and then it represented something. What did it represent? It represented the mercy seat. I'm sorry. Mercy seat. The mercy seat, yes, on top of it. Yeah. Where God would speak, right? From which God would speak, and yeah. But it represented God Himself. Yeah. Right. And yeah. not only that. 
it was the very presence of God in those days. Right? So wherever the ark was, that was the presence of God. Okay, so here was God's presence. Here, or we could say, here was God in that ark, ark of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, in that ark of covenant. And that was in this person's house. And what happened to that person's house? Obed-Edom's house. Okay, just look at the verse. So, he says he was blessed, right? So, was it small or big or something hidden, something significant? What do you think from these verses? How was he blessed? Was he, you know, he got up every morning, he had this amazing sense of peace and uh, presence of God and he just worshipped. In what way was he blessed? Sorry? In everything, right? So it says here, and the Lord blessed, verse 10, verse 11, and the Lord blessed Obed Edom and all his household. Okay? And uh, it says, this was what was told of Obed Edom to David. Okay? Which means that people around got to hear of this, got to see this for themselves. That's what it means, right? So, which means that um, they saw something was different in his household. They saw something was different in his life. Oh, Obedinam, you know, how come you have so many sheep? I don't know. For the last three months, it's been like that. You know, how come your field, you know, there's so much of yield and so much of this thing? I don't know. How come your you know, children are doing well? I really don't know. For the last three months, it's been like that. Right? So she means in all areas of his life, he actually thrived, he flourished, he prospered. Right? And it was so visible. Okay. What does that mean? That means that people could see it for themselves. They said there's something is different. The ark of God is there in the house, and something is different about this guy. Something is different about his family. And it was so visible and so uh, you know tangible. So they went. And news of this reached David. So David was in another city. The news of this reached David. So they said, hey, something is happening. Okay, you, you, you're able to understand, right? So something is happening. You know, maybe, see, if you look at Bible college, classes happening here and, and you know, outside in the road, nobody would know what is happening here. You know, 12 o'clock, we, we have supernatural hour. Nobody knows. But imagine if something was happening physically, tangible, so that people outside know that, hey, there is something happening here. It's like that. In his house, something was happening that others would know. The neighbors came to know, the, the whole you know, place came to know, and news of this reached David. And when it reached David, when he realized, hey, the presence of God in the ark of God, uh, we need to move that. So that was the plan, original plan anyway, to bring it back to the, you know, the city of David. So, so, so much so that he, he decided, he said, you know, we need to bring up. And then because of this, so David, it says, David went up. Uh, so David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David. Right? So what does that show us? What does that teach us? Huh? You can use the mic. Presence of God is a blessing for us. Presence of God is a blessing for us. Okay. Anyone else? Presence of God prospers you. Presence of presence of God prospers. Prospered him. So we know that presence of God prospers. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? So the Bible talks about in his presence, the presence of the Lord. In his presence, there is fullness. It talks about fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Right? It talks when we look at the spirit of the Lord, in where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Okay. So it talks about where God is. 
the whole atmosphere changes. The whole thing changes, right? If there is hopelessness, there is hope. If there is, you know, total lack of peace, there is peace. Because his rule and reign, his kingdom, is about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Right? So it's like if God steps into a place and there is change. Right? So that's what's happening here, which means that God is all about thriving and flourishing and bringing about change for the better in people's lives. And that's what happened to Obed-Edom. Right? So it's the very nature and character of God to bless. To bring about blessing, to bring about change for the better. Okay, so says there's something that we need to, you know, have it ingrained in our minds. You know, God is about bringing change for the better. God is about lifting up people, not destroying people's lives. Right? He's about bringing change. His very presence is a presence that brings about joy and righteousness and peace. And right? His presence brings shalom. Yeah, so that's something that we see. Okay, one more example, Elisha, um, and uh, the example, uh, the 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 kind of miracle that happened, right? So we see Second uh, uh, Kings four verses one to seven. Read about the 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 woman, uh, the widow, um, and then and then she's in debt, right? Um, so Elisha said to her, verse two, Second Kings four verse two. What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Sorry. Yeah, but a jar of oil. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, then pour it out um, into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. Verse 5, so she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons and brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out, that little jar of oil, into all the vessels. Now it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. There's no more. There are no more vessels. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil, pay your debt, you and your sons live on the rest. Okay, so it talks about a very, very difficult situation. Yeah, very difficult situation. The prophet is dead. Or one of the sons of the prophet, he's dead. His wife is there. There are two sons, and they have a lot of debt which means they might have borrowed money, they don't have the money to give back, and so the creditors, the people from whom they borrowed, are coming to take away their sons, maybe to work, you know, like a bonded labor or something, whatever. And then here comes Elisha, and uh, he speaks, he instructs according to the word of the Lord. Instruction is go gather the vessels. You have only this jar of oil pour into all the vessels. Okay, so they went, they borrowed the vessels from everywhere, they uh, they they start filling out. So when, when she starts pouring out, there is a there is a mirac miracle. Okay. So what does a miracle, any miracle, what does it show us? Miracle meaning, you know, something supernatural, something miraculous, which is orchestrated by God. Right? So what does it show us, teach us? Something that is humanly possible, but something that is possible with God. Right? Okay. Anything else? I'm sorry? It shows the significance of God's, yeah, God's touch, God's power, what it can do. Yeah. Then, anybody online? You witness a miracle, what does it tell you about God? It has to, right? It's from God. 
it has to we need to learn something about god through the miracle so what do you learn what does a miracle tell you about god anything else apart from what we heard okay so deepu god says, is a supernatural source of everything okay so god is a source but a supernatural source which means above the natural okay deepu miracles show the provision of god okay that god is a provider then lucy god is all powerful okay yeah so it it shows the heart of god it shows the nature of god every miracle see every miracle we go wow looking at the miracle right because it's it's so not the norm is above the normal is above the natural that's why we call it supernatural right but we also need to see the hand behind the miraculous the miracle maker right it's it it has a signature on it it points to him and all that you have described it shows his heart right so here it's a financial miracle because she is going to sell this oil get money out of it and which is going to you know take care of all the debts and everything and take care of their living so it's a financial miracle okay so what does that show us about god that god cares that god cares yeah because they are in the debt they are, they are actually in a very difficult end of the road no hope kind of a situation it shows that god cares yeah um, brings anything out of nothing yeah sure so it shows that god cares it shows that god loves it shows that he's a good god right and he shows that god you know when there is a need financial need that god is not against it and he blesses he gives it also talks about his generosity and his ability to give right efficiency 2 talks about the fact that now god is uh, efficiency 2 or efficiency 3 um is able to do exceedingly abundantly is that efficiency 2 or 3 320 right he is able which means talks about his ability to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think and right. ask or imagine or ask or think so that's get this god so when you look at this miracle it's, it talks about the fact that he's able to do his ability it also shows us that he's willing to do okay ability is one thing willingness is something else you know so because some people might be able but they're not willing they don't have the willingness hey i can do it but i don't want to right here it talks about god's ability and also god's willingness to bless and it's in the area of finances right so it talks about how generous he is right if you if you notice there's one verse which says um so the mother says to the son hey bring me another vessel everything is full now all the vessels are full maybe they had some 20 vessels big small you know they're filling can you just imagine everything is filled with oil everything is filled with oil they are just you know keeping it all over the place and then she says hey get me another vessel and the son says there's no other vessel we've exhausted you know we've brought everything that's it there's nothing else and then the oil stops you know we always think okay what if they had 10 more vessels or 20 more vessels or 30 more vessels that would have continued right so which talks about the limitless nature of god or the limitless ability of god to provide right so again it gives us an idea of god's heart who god is what he can do and why he does these things right so again you know our our understanding about god you know there should be a shift in our minds if this is who god is and we 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 understand god according to the word of god okay now there could be n number of factors why our experience is not according to this many factors right many things 
and we can't really pinpoint everything but when we go to the word we see god described as this we see his workings in this manner so that should be our understanding of god right okay what is the next one we look at another one luke chapter 5 in the new testament we see luke chapter 5 um we've maybe read it many times it's about peter fisherman fished all night um and then you know he gets into one of the boat and uh, and then says tells uh, peter you know get into the uh get into the sea and then he preaches from the boat and then he says you know uh, launch out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. That is Luke chapter 5 and verse 4. Okay. Launch out into the deep, go into the deep waters, put down your nets for a catch. Now the situation is that they have not caught anything. Okay, And how long did they fish? All night. Right. All night they have fished, they have not caught anything. And uh, which means this is not the first time for Peter. He's an experienced fisherman. And uh, when we read through the other verses, we see that they actually they have other partners, which means he's actually a fishing businessman. Right? This is the business that he's in. So it says here, let's read um, verse 5. Simon answered and said, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Okay? And then he says something very significant. He says, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Okay, he says, Jesus, this is our experience, but your word and instruction is goes against my experience. Yeah? He says, Lord, all night we have fished, we have not caught anything. Nevertheless, at your word, I will do the same thing. Okay? I did the same thing all night. Nothing happened. But now here's your instruction. Here's your word. You're asking me to do the same thing again. I will do it. He says, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And what happened? When they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. Verse 7, so they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Okay, so, so we see something here. We see that he followed the instruction of Jesus, even though it went beyond his logic and reasoning and his very recent experience. You know, experience can... Um, uh, it can be a great learning experience for us. You know, whatever, I mean, learning for us, whatever our experience is, you know. Maybe we, on our way to college, you know, certain things happened or, you know, that's a fresh experience in our minds, right? So it's, it's a fresh learning. And so it's still fresh in our minds. So no matter if somebody says, you know, hey, actually, you know, that road is not, it's, it's, it's not crowded. You know, you will say, what are you saying? I just came. I just came past Krishna Jayanti College. I know the kind of traffic there is. You know, there's so much of traffic jam. Don't tell me, you know, I just came. Why do you say that with so much confidence? Your experience, you just experienced it. So Peter has so much confidence saying, Lord, whole night we have fished. Nothing. Fresh experience, right? Recent experience. And he's tired and, you know, he says, I, we've toiled all night. Which means hard labor, you know, letting down net, you know, so it's a lot of work. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. So he does that again. And there's, a, again, this financial miracle. You know, why do we say financial miracle? Because that's his business. Fishing is his business. And verse 7 talks about the partners. They are partners in the other boats, which means that it was a, it was a partnership. He was he was into fishing as a business, and this is what he did for a living, right? So, the Lord prospered him in his business. Okay. So, what do we learn from this? Taking we take God at His word. Yeah, 
irrespective of our recent experience and learning, especially when you know that God has spoken, right? So that's another thing. It's not we're not assuming, we're not presuming something, but God has spoken, clear instruction. Let me go and do it. What else? Mm. Yeah. So God is, you know, God is a big God. And when he gives, he gives generously. He doesn't hold back. And sometimes his generosity just shocks us. Right? It's, it's not even in proportion to our, you know, efforts or whatever. It just shocks us. What else? Some important things that we learn from. What else? Diksha? What do you learn? I forgot your name, Mr. Huh? Sabita, Sabita. Okay. Sabita Diksha. Yeah, God is more than willing to provide if we are obedient to His word. Okay. What else do you learn? Simon's obedience. Hmm. Yeah, even beyond his reasoning. Okay, what does it talk about? What does it uh, point or what does it show about God? Now, these are all, you know, good, um, yeah, accurate observations. Um, what does it tell us about God? Anyone? Sapu? Joseph? What do, you, what do you learn? What else do you learn? You know, one thing I see is that God is not against business. Right? So sometimes we, we think, you know, or people who are in business also think of themselves as second class Christians. Okay, that person is in ministry, but I'm in business. I, I'm, only, I'm only in business, whatever. No, we don't see anything here. We see God's hand, God's supernatural power, God's blessing right there in that business. That's what we see here. Right? So we see that God is not against business. God is not against prospering somebody's business. Okay. When you're talking about business, meaning you know somebody's maybe selling something, buying something, and you know all that um, they could be in. Yeah, Andrew, um, God's provision of finance. Okay, yeah. So f when it comes to finances, God's prov provision. Yeah. So we see that God's not against uh, prospering someone. So we, we think, okay, what is this business? Wealth and you know, more and more money and, you know, all that we think, right? Somebody's doing some kind of business, you know. But this is one record-breaking yield, right? Two boats almost about to sink because of the fish, the very thing that they went to catch, right? So God is more than willing, more than able to bless, to prosper. So we're going to, you know, we're going to, so when we when we think about this, there are so many questions, right? So, so many questions in our mind. So what kind of business, how to do business, you know, what what kind of business will you bless and uh, what kind of method will you bless, etc. So we're going to look at some of those things, right? Principles um, for prosperity and also hindrances for prosperity, meaning, hey, I, I, I myself can do certain things to hinder God blessing me. To stop God from blessing me, right? It could be lack of faith, it could be disobedience, it could be the very methods that I use, unrighteous means, etc. So here we see, you know, we, we understand and we learn all this about God's heart about business. He richly gives. Okay. Um, first Timothy 6 17. I think by now we should know the verse. Yeah. First Timothy 6 17, what does it say?
command those who are rich in this age, present age, not to be haughty, but not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who richly gives us all things to enjoy. Okay. It talks about God, talks about where we should put our faith and trust in, and um, also talks about God's heart for his people, for prospering his people. You know, he richly gives us all things to enjoy. Okay. Um, okay, one more thing is about uh, in Matthew 17, I missed that. Matthew 17, verse 24, about paying taxes through, sorry, through a miracle. Um, this is the conversation they have, Jesus and Peter have about paying the tax, right? So, uh, verse 24, when they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay temple tax? He said, yes. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him saying, what do you think, Simon, from whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes, from their sons or from strangers? Peter said to him, from strangers. Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. Okay. Matthew 17, um, verses 24 to 27. Okay. Um, Okay. So, uh, 24, 27, and then it doesn't talk about how the whole thing ends, right? But I'm sure that um, by then, Peter has had enough experience. You know, after that, Luke chapter 5, what we have seen. Uh, so here, I'm sure he just says, okay, I'll go do it. I take a hook, put it into the sea, catch a fish, open the fish's mouth, coin, and then pay the tax, right? So again, uh, a supernatural act. So from all these incidents, all these uh, you know examples that are there in the word, we see that God is more than willing, God is able, and he does not, you know, for him, it's no big thing to bless us materially and financially. Okay, whenever we think of blessing, we we you know we think of all other things except finances, or we might not include finances because the, of the image that money has, right? Because of the way money is used, or because of our own experience of you know, money not being used rightly. So we think, okay, now God. When we say blessing of God, it means the presence of God. It means the revelation, understanding of God. Yes, all that is true. Right? The knowledge of God, you know, all that is true. But it also means wholesome, you know, when it's, it's a wholesome picture that materially, financially, also that God wants to bless. Okay? Any questions? Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Can you can you use the mic? In all the examples that we've discussed so far in the passages, yeah. can we infer that you know at first most of us, just like all these disciples and Elisha and Peter, have put their effort, tried, and have realized their shortcomings or their failures, and then we look up to God for a breakthrough rather than doing it the other way around? Um, Most of them have put their efforts, they have tried, they have failed, they have understood, okay. Mm. And then yeah. you look to God. That's so right. do we also do that mistake? Well, actually, yeah, in Peter's case, yes, we know. But then when we look at the other, you know, other examples, and also the lives of Abraham, Isaac, you know, whom we, we saw, you see that Lord actually prospers them. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, if uh, I mean, if if our life has been like that in the sense we have not we have put in our effort, we have not really trusted God, 
and then we come to a place of really you know wholeheartedly trusting him and believing in him um, yes we see the hand of god but also uh, it you know when we know the truth um, and when we apply the truth of god then we see the power of that the truth um, in our lives and you know, experience the truth of god's um, the truth of god in our lives so so either way you know it it yeah it doesn't matter yeah okay any any other questions okay so we might have questions so 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 if all this is true you know why am i not rich right we might have questions you know maybe for those of us who maybe have not seen this kind of a blessing in allah we might we might think okay then why is it not happening in my life right am i doing something wrong or you know i've been praying i've been asking you know what is it okay so we look at that we're going to look at some principles we're going to look at you know certain things well all these all these supernatural acts of god talk about god's powerful intervention right there in time providing for their needs but we also see other ways and means by which god provides okay so we're going to look at that also okay right okay so let's look at the next topic which is god's guarantee to prosper his people okay now we looked at some of these examples and we know that god is a god who blesses god is a god who um you know whose supernatural acts bless and lift people from you know from that place of um no hope and desperateness and he fills them with riches okay now how can you and i be confident okay it's one thing to say okay see this happened in their life but i'm i'm not there i'm not in similar you know it's it's happened in them that's their testimony but what about my life right so how can you and i living today how can you and i be confident that god wants to bless us right we need to be confident only then we can stand in faith right we need to have this solid understanding of god's word otherwise it will be like okay god if you want to you do it otherwise you don't we will be in a you know in a state of um not strong faith you know state of shaky faith we will waver at the promise of god something opposite of what abraham actually did you know he did not waver at the promise of god through unbelief you know so we don't want unbelief to creep in we want to be confident right we want to be confident can we be confident that it is god's will to prosper us okay okay right so let's look at a few uh, scriptures yeah we will have a few minutes more so um genesis 1 okay so we are, what we are saying is that it is god's nature to bless okay god's nature it's part of his it's part of who god is okay so when we say god's nature we're saying it's its personality it's it's who he is to bless okay so sometimes when we when we look at certain people like say okay it's it's his nature it's in nature himself it's his nature is like that like he's always short tempered his nature is like that right he's generous his nature is like that okay what does that mean that means this is who he is as a person this is who he is as a person right maybe he's a very patient guy this is his nature this is who he is right so when we look at god we see that it is god's nature to bless okay um genesis 1 27 28 it says so god created man in his own image in the image of god he created him male and female he created them what does he do then god blessed them created blessed okay then god blessed them and said to them be fruitful multiply etc etc so we see god creating we see god blessing okay um just one other verse james 1 verse 17 okay james chapter 1 verse 17 you know these these scripture i think we need to really spend time meditating on them just 
making it part of our lives, right? Um, James 1.17, it says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Okay, which means that, okay, today I will bless, tomorrow I will curse. No, that's not God, right? With whom there is no shadow or variation of turning. Okay, it says every good gift, every perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. Okay, so which means when God gives, He gives a good gift. When God gives, He gives a perfect gift. Okay, so, so which means that again, it talks about the nature of God to bless, the nature of God to give something good for His children. Okay, okay, so we'll stop here and we'll catch up next class. Thank you.